This Filmmaker IQ lesson is proudly sponsored by Rode Microphones, premium microphones and audio accessories for studio, live, and location recording. John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com. Today we're going to dissect the history of cinematic blood from its origin in theater and cover some of the classic recipes used in the movies. Now, fair warning to the squeamish, this is going to get a little messy. Stage blood has been around the theater as long as there's been a need for bloodied characters. But the red stuff really began to run in a small niche theater in Paris, France. The Théâtre du Grand Guinau. Founded on a former chapel in 1894, the Grand Guinau, which literally meant the theater of the big puppet, became a popular tourist attraction for their gory, blood-soaked horror plays, which included dismemberment and eye gouging. The theater continued in operation until the early 1960s, when audiences turned away from the theater to the drive-in for their bloodlust. Using real blood on stage for these theater productions carries with it moral, ethical, as well as sanitary issues. Plus the stuff likes to coagulate. Great for healing a wound, but not so great for an actor that needs to bleed on command. So what did they use for fake blood at the Grand Guinau? It's kind of an industry secret, but according to Mel Gordon, a theater professor at UC Berkeley, it was equal parts carmine and glycerin. The base of Grand Guignau blood is glycerin. Now glycerin or glycerol is a common polyol or sugar alcohol and it resembles a thick syrupy liquid. You'll find this in most drugstores sold as pure glycerin used for moisturizing skin. Carmine is a deep red pigment created by boiling and then draining the Armenian cochineal or Polish cochineal, also called Crimson Lake cochineal or natural red four, it's a little harder to find this insect-based coloring even though it is used in the food industry. So we'll replace it with, nat with regular liquid dye food coloring that you can find in the grocery store. Now the bulk of it will be red. Let's get that in there. And then we'll add a little bit of yellow. And then just a drop of blue food coloring to darken. Too much blue and we run the risk of turning our blood purple. Now since carmine is a powder pigment, to give the mixture a little bit more of a thickness and opacity, or less opacity, we'll add just a little bit of cornstarch. Now we're not baking here. The exact proportions of dyes and base aren't that crucial. But if you are making batches of this every day for a multi-day shoot, you should probably be more careful with the measurements. Otherwise, one or two batches at a time, just keep an eye on your concoction. Get to the color and consistency that you like. The last director of the Grand Guy now, Charles Noden, personally mixed nine different shades of blood daily. Some of his recipes called for methyl cellulose, a common gel-like ingredient found in laxatives and is used for making movie slime. And when the blood didn't have to run, they even used current jelly. But it's this glycerin mix that was used for the runny stuff. To help us with today's demonstration, we chose a volunteer from our YouTube comment section. Dialer Turden2 is a former assistant manager at Blockbuster Video and can now be seen on YouTube offering insightful comments such as first. He's also appeared on IMDB forums, 4chan's B-board, and is a regular on moviepoopshoot.com. CGI sucks. You can tell that it's fake. I mean, any five-year-old can tell the difference between real life and an unreal tournament engine. Hashtag no green screen. <laughs> Dorks. I like your old intro better. The Grand Guinau formula is one of the easier blood recipes to pull off. As you can see, it's quite effective. 
Uh, glycerin has a warm sensation to it, and since it's a common food additive, it's safe to use around the mouth, although you probably don't want to be swallowing spoonfuls of this stuff. If it gets in your eye, it can sting, but it probably won't do any damage. Glycerin by itself has almost the perfect viscosity and shyness to stand in for real blood. It also creates nice flowing patterns when running down walls. The only drawback is it's kind of expensive, probably the most expensive of the ones we'll demonstrate today. Even though we didn't use carmine, the red food dye and cornstarch managed to create a good color. But the color really didn't matter much if you were shooting in black and white film. In fact, you really didn't see much blood on screen at all. Silent films like D.W. Griffith's 1916 epic Intolerance show only a brief glimpse of blood during the battle scene, and even then, it's a bit cheesy. The horror genre didn't offer much more. Murnau's 1922 Nosferatu favored gothic mood over gore. The only sight of blood is in this quick shot when a coachman cuts his finger with a knife. Even the climax with Orlock hunched over the woman is completely bloodless. Fast forward to the sound era and the universal gothic horror cycle. And again, we have the exact same scene from 1931's Dracula being one of the rare sightings of blood in a vampire flick. As the Hollywood movie making industry became more organized in the 30s and 40s, a form of self-censorship was created to prevent government intervention. This censorship came in the form of the Production Code, commonly referred to as the Hayes Code after Will Hayes, the president of the MPPDA. The code explicitly states that brutal killings are not to be presented in detail, which pretty much acts blood right off the screen. But the code's power started to die off in the 50s, first with the Supreme Court ruling in the case of Joseph Burstein Incorporated v. Wilson, which held for the first time that film was protected free speech and thus safe from government censorship. And then from the ever ominous threat of television. Widescreen, surround sound, and epic pictures were the roads that the big studios took to lure people away from the boob tube. Blood, sex, and monsters was the strategy of the smaller independents. And if you were shooting in black and white, well, you could buy fake blood ready-made right at the grocery store. Do you like Bosco? It's okay. It's a little too sweet for my taste. But when 60, when Psycho came out, I think it really came in its own, both artistically and commercially. Using chocolate syrup to simulate blood and black and white gives it a darker, oozier, almost demonic look. And a sheen of bloody, consummate professionalism that really gives the movie a big boost. It's the perfect blood for Hitchcock's bitter and cynical sense of humor. In 68, George Romero used Bosco in his undisputed masterpiece, Night of the Living Dead. A film so disturbing that few people actually listen to the message. But they should, because it's not just about zombies and gore, it's a deep personal statement about society itself. Hey! I like Hershey's better. He drank my milkshake. The great thing about chocolate syrup is it's ready to use straight out of the bottle. When shooting in black and white, you have to be cognizant about how your colors will look in gray. Reds can kind of wash out, especially if you're using red filters to lighten the skin. With chocolate syrup being so dark, it will retain that dark, oozy look pretty much no matter what you do and how you push your image. Chocolate syrup by itself is going to be pretty thick, thicker than blood, so it's not quite the same look, but it has a special surreal quality. Of course, in color, basic chocolate syrup just isn't going to work. There are a lot of recipes you'll find online that use chocolate syrup as their base, and they mix in some food coloring, but film producers turn to a different base. 
One of the first bloody low budget color horror outings to make a killing was The Curse of Frankenstein in 1957, kicking off the Hammer horror cycle. Hammer, a British studio, was not under the jurisdiction of Hollywood's production code, so they could specialize in gory reboots of classic horror icons that featured a lot of blood. This formulation of blood became known as Kensington Gore, a pun on the name of a pair of London streets that adjoin each side of Royal Albert Hall. Kensington Gore was formulated by retired pharmacist John Tinnegate. Unlike the sugar alcohol used at the Grand Guy now, Kensington Gore uses golden syrup or light treacle, a syrup made from sugar cane or sugar beet. Water is added to thin the mixture just a little bit, just about two to one. And to color it, we'll use our combination of red yellow and blue food dye. Go real light on the blue, adding a few drops at a time. Now to make it a little more opaque, we'll add corn flour, which is called corn starch here in the States. Just a little bit helps, makes it a little less runny. But use it sparingly. We're making blood, not roux. And when it's too thick, it will stick to itself unnaturally. Now traditional Kensington Gore added mint extract to give it an acceptable flavor. But if you're intending to use it outdoors, you may want to try peppermint oil instead as it's a natural deterrent to flies, bees, and wasps. Plus it makes it taste like candy cane. Jeez, somebody get this guy a teleprompter. Wandering eyes are killing me. Hashtag memorize your lines. The Kensington Gore, the sugarcane based Kensington Gore, can get pretty sticky, but uh, chocolate syrup withstanding, probably one of the better tasting bloods. But if you can't find cane syrup, it's easy enough to make by boiling some water and sugar until the mixture becomes super saturated. Uh, be careful with the peppermint as it can sting the eyes, but probably won't do any long-term damage. The real trick with Kensington Gore is balancing just how much cornstarch to add. Too much and we get some weird looking bubbles. That's why you want to be very sparing with it, but if you're careful, you can get that classic hammer horror look. The Kensington Gore formulation would be used by Stanley Kubrick in the infamous elevator blood scene in The Shining. Now, guessing that Kubrick shot at one half miniature scale, visual effects artist David Ridlin used a digital simulation and estimated that about 360 gallons of this red stuff was used to create this shot. But Kensington Gore could look a little too red on film. It wouldn't be until the 70s when legendary makeup artist Dick Smith created the standard Hollywood blood formula, working on bleeding edge films like The Godfather, The Exorcist, and Taxi Driver. In fact, Taxi Driver's finale scene, as it was originally shot, was so bloody and gruesome that the MPAA threatened to slap an X rating on the film. Director Martin Scorsese came up with a unique solution and ran the film through some processes to desaturate the color and make the blood a darker sapia tone. The MPAA gave it an R rating, but Scorsese had the last laugh as he felt it gave the film a more disturbing look. The practice of desaturating blood to make it more palatable continues to this day. Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill Volume 1 goes so far as to dip into black and white in this crazy 88 battle at the House of the Blue Leaves. Done to appease the ratings board, Tarantino also used it as an homage to the practice of showing kung fu films in black and white on TV during the 70s and 80s to scrub the blood from the airwaves. For the Japanese release, Tarantino skips the black and white and leaves it all in its full color glory. 
Dick Smith's formulation is pretty similar to Kensington Gore, except we changed the base from golden syrup to corn syrup, which is much cheaper here in the US. To that, Smith adds a little bit of water and then colors it with Eller red and yellow food coloring. Now those aren't available in stores anymore, but they're most likely lake pigments. Lake pigments don't dissolve in water, but rather create a suspension resulting in a more opaque look. Fortunately, lake pigments are really hard to find, so we'll stick to our everyday dye food coloring combination of mostly red, a little bit of yellow, and a drop of blue. To compensate for not using lake pigments, some recipes use zinc oxide, which is often added to oil paint and even sprinkled in breakfast cereal as a source of zinc. Zinc oxide is non-toxic and safe to eat, obviously. But if you want a cheaper substitute, we can borrow an ingredient from Sam Raimi's Evil Dead and use non-dairy creamer instead. Add a bit of time and then stir in to get the consistency right. Now there are two other special ingredients in Dick Smith's recipe. The first is methylparaben, which is a food preservative commonly used in makeup to keep bacteria and mold from growing. If we're going to use this blood right away, I think you can forego that ingredient. The next is Kodak PhotoFlow. Now PhotoFlow is a wetting agent used in developing film prints, which basically breaks the surface tension of the water and allows the solution to spread more evenly over a print. But PhotoFlow is pretty nasty and expensive stuff, not to mention poisonous. The alternative is just a drop of non-bleach detergent. But if we want to keep this mixture editable, we can use lecithin, which is a naturally occurring fatty acid commonly added to foods as an emulsifier or wetting agent. Basically, lecithin allows the mixture to, like mayonnaise, to stay in a suspension. You can get liquid lecithin at certain health food stores. This is made from sunflower seeds. If you can't find this, you can always buy gel caps and then cut them open for the lecithin oil inside. I like to add just a little bit of peppermint to this as well to give it that candy flavoring. Now it's just a matter of stirring and mixing everything together. If you want, you can leave some of those bits of creamer inside to make it look like chunks of coagulated blood. But I like to get it all stirred in there. I think this is ready for our horror movie. I can't take this guy seriously because of the way he pronounces horror. It's horror, not horror. Hashtag your mom. Even though this is only an approximation of Dick Smith's recipe, it's by far my favorite for looks and texture. I feel like you really have good control over the blood by adjusting each of the ingredients. Non-dairy creamer is an easy ingredient for adding that opaque look and doesn't thicken the blood as much as cornstarch, but the lecithin does a great job of breaking up the blood's surface tension, allowing it to drip nicely. From Grand Geek Now, Chocolate Syrup, Kensington Gore, and Dick Smith's Corn Syrup Based Blood, there's a lot of ways to get the screen to bleed. Today we focused on sugar syrup based recipes. They're relatively easy to find the ingredients and they're safe to eat. But there are thousands of other ways to make fake blood. You could even take bulk hand soap and add some food coloring. Or you can buy commercially available pre-mixed blood. But at the end of the day, all this fake blood can make a really big mess. On the film Carrie, actress Sissy Spacek complained that she felt like a candied apple standing near the flames as the corn syrup caramelized on her skin. Bruce Campbell, speaking about his experience on Evil Dead, recalled drying his fake blood-soaked shirt by the fire, only to have it crack when he put it back on as the sugar in the corn syrup had crystallized. So a couple brief things about cleanup. Don't wear any underwear that you would get emotionally attached to. There's no guarantee this won't stain them permanently pink. 
For cleaning up the gore, actors who work with fake blood nightly recommend using shaving cream to keep the blood from staining the skin. Not only does it help clean, but it's not as abrasive as regular soap and actually moisturizes the skin. Hey, you missed a button. Hashtag continuity error. Where'd he go? Oh, you want me to ask Cupcake on the wall? What say you, fuzzy britches? Feel like talking? Ah, I guess not. Why should she be any different? clean up this mess. And you, now that you have some ideas, go out there and experiment. Have fun, but be safe, and make something bloody great. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at FilmmakerIQ.com.